Thank you for joining. My name is Matt Thomas, and this is the USGS Landslide Hazard Seminar. This meeting is co-organized with contributions from Stephen Slaughter and Jamie Kostelnik. And for those of you that are new to this meeting, uh, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. Uh, we're going to wait till the end of the presentation today to take questions. So in the meantime, uh, please just do your best to make sure your microphone is muted and your video is off when you aren't intending to speak. And uh, I'll try to keep an eye on that as well. Uh, Josh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I just also want to take the opportunity to thank you and the rest of the US crew for putting this on for all these months. It's been a spectacular way to punctuate the week, uh, and I've learned a ton from the crews you brought in. So. Um, Thanks for doing that. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Will Struble. Um, Will finished his PhD here at Oregon a little over a year ago. And um, Will was a, 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 is a native of Carson City and graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno. He's in the Honors College there and got connected with Earth Sciences and Scott McCoy and did some really cool work looking at normal fault bounded ranges and erosion rates and um, looking at morphology and how that reflects slip rates and some really neat work that's um, come out in some publications that you can go find. Um, I was uh, on a major lobbying effort to get Will to come here to UVO once uh, we got some funding for this NEHER project that you're going to hear about today. So we got uh, some funding based on the discovery that there's all these landslide dam lakes and a lot of suggestion that maybe they are associated with earthquakes or um, forces um, unknown. And um, it was an opportunity to do something new and different uh, and um, Will was the guy that uh, was really well suited and he did the work you're going to hear about today, um, which involves just a lot of um, going through pretty rugged, pretty, pretty serious landscapes uh, and then doing really detailed analysis on the tree ring records. Uh, but then he also did several papers about using topography to unravel the evolution of the Cascadia margin more generally and things about the Willamette Valley that I never knew before that Will has taught me. So he's um, just basically, you know, peeled back many layers about um, Cascadia that have just continued to um, be tantalizing and lead to new questions. And so the stuff you're going to hear about today was funded by the USGS. Uh, we've had some great partnerships that Will will tell you about along the way, but it was a pleasure to uh, have him here and seeing him um, on to next steps in his postdoc has been great. And uh, uh, Will, uh, take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you, Josh, uh, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, I just want to reiterate what Josh just said, how much I've really enjoyed over the past year or two being able to join in on the seminar series. Um, I've really learned a lot, and it's been awesome to hear from people working on a wide range of problems um, in the landslide community and across a wide range of institutions as well. Um, so today, I'm really excited to be able to share some of the work that made up a decent chunk of my dissertation, uh, specifically thinking about uh, the triggering mechanisms responsible for bedrock landslides in Cascadia, um, and also for thinking about geomorphic um, impacts on where we see landslide dam lakes specifically uh, most likely to be preserved in the Oregon Coast Range. Um, oh, having trouble moving forward. Um, and before getting started, I just want to acknowledge a few people, um, most notably my co-authors, including Josh, but also Brian Black, Bill Burns, Nancy Calhoun, and Logan Weatherell, um, but also so many others who provided immense help both in field work, um, sample preparation, lab work, helpful discussions, um, and of course there's many, many more people beyond those I could list here. So for many people, when we think about um, the hazard posed by earthquakes, the first thing that comes to mind um, is the hazard posed by ground motion or shaking. And this is especially the case um, in situations such as here. Um, this is on the South Island of New Zealand following the Kaikoura earthquake, where we have faults that rupture the surface. And in many of these situations, we have ground motion that can cause catastrophic damage. Um, along subduction zones, we're also concerned about the hazard posed by tsunamis, such as during the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. Uh, but for many people who are listening, we're often more preoccupied by the hazard that's posed by large bedrock landslides. And there's great reason for this. There's a number of very recent large earthquakes that have produced numerous bedrock landslides. So the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake and again the 2016 Kaikoura earthquakes um, both triggered on the order of tens to hundreds of thousands of large deep-seated landslides. 
Um, more on um, in North America, we have an example um, from 1984, the Northridge earthquake. Um, it triggered over 10,000 landslides. Now these landslides are hazardous in and of themselves, but they can pose a secondary hazard if they happen to come down into valleys and dam streams and form lakes. And indeed, during the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, about 150 dams formed following that event. Um, and in many cases, we can see outburst floods released from these dams if the dam happens to fill catastrophically or is overtopped by the lake upstream. Um, and there were um, some outburst floods observed following the Kaikoura earthquake during heavy rainfall. Um, a notable Pacific Northwest example includes Quake Lake in Montana. It was um, triggered in 1959 after a magnitude 7.3 earthquake. Um, and then an another notable example is the Bonneville landslide on the Columbia River Gorge, uh, which at one time temporarily dammed the Columbia River. And it's been a source of discussion for a long time in terms of what actually triggered the Bonneville landslide and how old it is. Today, though, I'm going to be talking specifically about landslides in the Oregon Coast Range, which stretches from southwestern Oregon in the Klamath Mountains near the border of California, all the way north to the Columbia River with the border of Washington. And it's situated along the Cascadia subduction zone, where the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting under the northwestern margin of North America. Zooming into the Oregon Coast Range, this is a lighter hillshade. Uh, from a part of the coast range near the Umpqua River, which is down here on the southern half of this whole shade, flowing from right to left. And in this DEM, we can see there's a strong contrast in landscape morphology from the west side of this image, where we see uh, steeply dissected, evenly spaced ridges and valleys, where incision is primarily um, dominated by debris flows and in some locations further downstream fluvial processes. And as we move further east, we see that hill slopes become much more low relief, very hummocky. These are large, deep seated landslides. Uh, many of them can um, compose very large landslide complexes, such as this one over here. And if we zoom in on a downstream part of it, we can see that we have a younger bedrock landslide nested within one of the older failures that has come down into this valley and dammed a stream, and we have a lake that's formed upstream. This is Bertrand Lake. And these landslide dam lakes are quite common throughout the Oregon Coast Range, but they compose only a small part of an even larger data set of just bedrock landslides in general. Um, to date, there's been over 20,000 deep-seated bedrock landslides mapped. Um, and of those, over 200 include mapped landslide dams represented by the black um, dots in this image. Now, every year, um, especially rainy seasons, um, we tend to see numerous numbers of shallow landslides that mobilize into debris flows. But generally, historically, Historically, we've observed very few bedrock landslides. Um, that's not to say there's none, um, but compared to shallow landslides and debris flows, they're conspicuously rare. Um, and this is especially the case for landslide dam lakes. And in fact, um, in terms of historically documented landslide dam lakes, only two that have been historically observed remain stable to date. That is, they still um, impound a lake. Um, although there may be a third, um, as of the winter of 2016 to 2017, over near the town of Florence, there was a fairly large deep seated landslide that formed a lake. And having conversations with people who have been going out to the site to do field work, as far as I'm aware, this lake is still here. So we can essentially increase that number now to three. But so the fact that we see so many shallow landslides and debris flows each year, but in general, very few bedrock landslides, but the fact that the bedrock landslides are quite common throughout the landscape, has often raised the question, well, what's the actual process that's primarily responsible for triggering these landslides? And because we're situated along the Cascadia subduction zone, it's often been invoked to explain the distribution of deep-seated slides in Western Oregon. Now, we know from a variety of sources that the last earthquake occurred in late January of 1700. It was likely about a magnitude nine. Um, but even though we know that the last earthquake occurred in 1700 and likely produced a significant amount of shaking, uh, no landslide has ever been definitively linked to the 1700 earthquake. But since the shaking hazard posed by the subduction zone is high, it remains an important consideration for landslide hazards. So if we were to, to for instance, find a landslide that did indeed date to 1700, that would be exceptionally useful for hindcasting shaking from the 1700 earthquake and therefore for considering um, hazards and ground motion um, from future events. 
So if we want to continue to probe this question of whether landslides are primarily triggered by earthquakes on the subduction zone or perhaps hydrologic events, we really need subannually accurate landslide ages to more clearly and explicitly constrain the linkages between um, individual climatic events, be they uh, atmospheric rivers or rain on snow events and or seismic events with particular landslides. So this is likely review for a lot of people here, but I just want to briefly go over a couple of landslide geochronological tools at our disposal um, to date landslides. The first being radiocarbon or C14 dating, uh, which in the Pacific Northwest is definitely by far the most widely used technique, um, in no small part because we have so much organic material that's available to be dated. Um, but there's a couple issues with this technique if we're trying to link with um, a particular triggering mechanism. First off, the landslide or the residence time of a piece of organic material, be it a piece of wood, for example, uh, may be quite long relative to the age of a landslide. So you could have a piece of wood sitting in the soil for an even longer amount of time um, than the actual age of the landslide would provide. Um, and then also that um, C14 isn't constant in the atmosphere with time. Um, it, it exhibits temporal variability such that an individual C14 age from a sample needs to be calibrated and you can actually end up with multiple calendar year ages. So just to illustrate this, here we have a plot where on the Y axis we have um, a C14 age and the X axis is the calibrated age in calendar years. And here I have a red PDF which represents a hypothetical C14 age of 100 plus or minus 50 years. And the blue line here represents uh, the radiocarbon calibration curve, which essentially um, plots the variability of C14 in the atmosphere with time. Now to calibrate the C14 age, in essence, what we're doing is we're sliding the PDF parallel to the X axis along the curve. And any point in which the PDF intersects the calibration curve would correspond to a location um, or to a year, a calendar year in which that sample could have originated. So in this case, for this hypothetical sample, we would see in a range of age, ages from the late 1600s to the mid 1700s, and then again from the early 1800s to nearly 1950. And notably in this case, 1700 is within the range of possible ages. So if you were trying to explicitly link a landslide um, to the 1700 earthquake and you happen to collect the sample, 1700 is a possibility, but unfortunately you don't have the sufficiently accurate age to actually link landsliding with a particular triggering event, in this case, the 1700 earthquake. Uh, more recently, uh, using the surface morphology or the roughness of landslides has been used to establish age control. The idea being that young landslides tend to be quite rough and old landslides tend to be quite smooth. Uh, but to apply this technique, we need a calibrated model with a range of landslide ages. So here I'm going to highlight some work from Sean Lahusen in 2016 uh, in the North Fork Stillguamish Valley, where he um, calculated the age of several landslides along the river uh, using C14 dating, and as well as also using the known age of the 2014 Oso landslide. And then in each of these deposits, he measured the surface roughness of those landslides. And then fitting a regression to those data, he was able to estimate the age of landslides from throughout the North Fork Still Glomish Valley, as shown here. Now, while this is super useful to understand temporal patterns in landsliding, as well as spatial patterns in landslide events, um, it doesn't have the accuracy we need to actually get an age for an individual landslide to link with a known trigger. So this brings us to dendrochronology, um, which in our use here is specifically using dead trees that are killed by landslides um, to establish when the landslide occurred. So just to give a brief, a little bit of brief, brief background, um, tree rings essentially provide a record of climate over many decades to centuries. And in the Pacific Northwest, uh, tree rings are primarily sensitive to precipitation. So in this example here, we can see a series of wide rings prior to 1740. These likely correspond to fairly rainy years and then a sudden decrease in ring width um, as presumably the climate um, experiences a period of drought. Now we can collect measurements from live trees and build chronologies so we can understand how climate has varied over the past several hundred years. Um, and in Oregon, those live tree chronologies currently span approximately 800 years um, into the past. And for the Oregon Coast Range specifically, those chronologies extend just beyond 400 years. So we have live tree chronologies, but we can also go and collect tree ring measurements from dead trees 
and measure the rings and essentially build a chronology that we can then compare to those live tree chronologies to determine when trees died. So to illustrate this, this is from David Yamaguchi's paper in 1997, uh, where he has a live tree chronology spanning several hundred years. And then there's a series of dead trees that he measures the, where he measures the tree rings. Um, and then he essentially finds in an essence using a barcode kind of technique where um, the overlap is uh, best and he can establish when the trees died. And indeed, this is what he and Brian Atwater uh, used to establish uh, that the ghost forests along the southern Washington coast died in the winter of 1699 to 1700. And then it was written records in Japan that more clearly um, established that the earthquake occurred in late January of 1700. So I'll be talking about how we used endocrinology to establish the age of landslide dam lakes in Western Oregon. Again, these black dots is the full data set of landslide dams. And first, I'm going to talk about two specific sites, uh, Klickitat Lake, which is just west of Corvallis, and Wasson Lake, which is just southwest of Eugene. So when we go out to these sites, this is what we see. We see these large ghost forests, large standing snags that are primarily Douglas fir. Uh, we extract slabs from these trees, such as this one here. Um, ideally, we want more than 100 rings for analysis. Um, after sanding and polishing our slabs, we measure all the rings and we end up with a time series such as this one. This example is actually from a live tree. Um, in this example, you can see that uh, the tree ring width varies as a function of tree age. So as when the tree was younger, the ring widths are quite large. And as the tree ages, the rings tend to get much smaller. We want to be able to compare trees, though, that are different ages. So we need to be able to remove this long term signal as well as any other long wavelength signal due to uh, interdecadal climatic variability. So we fit a spline to this data set and normalizing the data by that spline, we end up with what is essentially the interannual variability in tree ring width. So this is uh, the chronology that currently exists for the Oregon Coast Range, or at least one of them. This is from Mary's Peak in the Oregon Coast Range, just west of Corvallis. On top of that, I'll place our dead collected chronology that we measured from dead trees at Klickitat Lake. And we'll cross correlate the two measurements. So in essence, we're lagging the two time series across each other until we find where there's a conspicuously high correlation coefficient. So in this case, we find that at Klickitat Lake, there's a high correlation coefficient in the year 1743. In this case, the outer rings were a little degraded. So we didn't want to measure those rings just to make sure we weren't biasing our measurements in any way. But it's a simple fix. We just count out to the outer edge of the tree where we have bark preserved. The presence of bark is super important because it allows us to establish the final year in which the tree actually grew and died. And in some cases, it can actually tell us in what season that happened. And then at Klickitat Lake, we also cored live trees on the landslide deposit because we were fortunate there was some old growth preserved in this location. The idea being that the trees on the landslide deposit should be old, younger than the actual age of the landslide itself. And indeed, in this case, we found that the trees began growing uh, approximately, approximately between 1760 and 1770. And all of this supports a landslide date in the winter of 1751 to 1752. Um, so at Klickitat Lake and several other sites, we also collected C14 um, samples to both corroborate the dendrochronology, but also to test how accurate C14 is depending on the type of sample we collected, be it from a standing snag or a detrital piece of material from the landslide body. And for this, I'm just going to show the results from Wasson Lake. Wasson Lake, we dated with dendrochronology to the winter of 1819 to 1820. And these are the C14 results here. Uh, first off, the red vertical line is our dendrochronology age of 1819 to 1820. And we have several different types of C14 ages here that I'll walk you through. Uh, the dark gray curves, these are probability density functions for um, C14 age. So these are the calendar year ages from that have been calibrated using the radiocarbon calibration curve. This first sample here, this is a piece of bark we collected from a standing tree in the lake. So we know from dendrochronology that that tree died in 1819 to 1820, sometime in that winter. Um, now, bark incorporates organic material from throughout the life of the tree. And um, we're likely seeing that in this result here because this sample is approximately 200 or more years older than the actual age of the landslide itself. 
We also collected pieces of wood from the landside deposit, these three samples here. This sample here is also approximately two to 300 years older than the landside deposit. So here we're likely either sampling a piece of wood that has experienced a prolonged residence time in the soil prior to the landside occurring, or we're inadvertently sampling an inner part of a tree that was broken up during the actual landsliding event. Um, since the inner part of a tree is by definition older, um, we arrive at an older C14 age. And then finally, these two samples here, these happen to correspond with the part of the calibration curve that wiggles quite a bit. Um, so because of that, we end with multiple sets of um, possible age ranges for these two samples. Now, we can also um, take advantage of knowing how far apart um, two samples should be in time. So we can utilize a technique called wiggle mashing, where we um, essentially sample two separate rings and a standing tree um, and find their individual C14 ages. And then given um, that we know how far apart in time those two rings are, we can constrain the output uh, age ranges. So these light gray PDFs here for both of these two samples correspond to the individual calibrated C14 ages for both of those samples by themselves. The dark gray curves correspond to the wiggle matched versions where we've essentially been able to narrow the range of output um, output PDFs. So we have this um, PDF for the 180th ring from this tree. We count out 81 years to the 99th ring. And then we count out the final 99 years to the edge of the tree. And we find that the output PDF for the age of this sample brackets our dendrochronology age quite well within a couple of decades. So if we're at a site and we can't use dendrochronology to date it, most likely because it's too old to overlap with existing chronologies, we can still use wiggle matching to at least get a rough idea, hopefully within a few decades of when that land site occurred. And then finally, I'm gonna come down to this separate X axis down here. Now this red line is our dendrochronology age. Um, these correspond to two pieces of charcoal we collected from the landslide deposit. And just focusing on this sample here, it's over 9,000 years older than the actual age of the landslide, highlighting that um, charcoal persists in the landscape for quite a long time. It does not degrade quickly. Um, so if we can't use endocrinology, we can't use wiggle matching, we at least want to make sure we're only sampling detrital wood and avoiding charcoal if possible. Okay, so now um, I'm going to highlight our results at the landslide dam lakes throughout uh, the Oregon Coast Range, now represented by the white squares here. Uh, the ones with letters correspond with locations where we have existing age control. So Klickitat and Wasson Lake are the two I just talked about. Ayers Lake and Gould Lake are the two historically observed failures. Gould Lake formed in the late 1890s and Ayers Lake formed in 1975. Uh, Triangle, Loon, and Sitcom Lakes are on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of years. Triangle Lake is specifically over 40,000 years old. So these are the results for our sites that post date 1700. Uh, the Y axis, these are our sites. The X axis is calendar year age since 1700. Uh, first off, I want to point out that the bullseye symbols correspond with sites where we had bark preserves so we could establish sub annually with seasonal accuracy when those landslides occurred. Sites where we unfortunately were not able to recover bark at those sites, we can only establish a maximum age, hence the open circles with the arrows. So the first takeaway at this point is that no landslide corresponds to the 1700 earthquake. But we do still see temporal clustering of multiple landslides, specifically four landslides in the winter of 1889 to 1890, um, and potentially more given these are all maximum ages down here. But focusing just on these four sites, um, they also spatially cluster down southwest of the city of Eugene near the Umpqua River, uh, these orange squares down here. So we dig through the historical records and we find that indeed there was major flooding in Western Oregon and Northern California in February of 1890. Now, late December of 1889 and the bulk of January of 1890 exhibited very heavy, very deep snowfall, especially by low elevation Western Oregon standards. Um, and then the snow was followed in early February, approximately February 5th is when it peaked. Um, by warm, intense rainfall, very consistent with atmospheric rivers that we see today. Um, so we had flooding observed from Northern California near the city of Eureka on the coast uh, to at least the Columbia River. 
Uh, and I, I want to stress that similar to more recent flooding events, this isn't just a flooding event that um, was due to rainfall, but it had a significant snowmelt component to it. Now, unfortunately, um, there's very few to no instrumented rainfall or stream flow records for this event. Eugene, for instance, didn't start recording meteorological or stream flow data until 1892, so we just missed that. But just given historical narratives, it appears it was likely the second largest flood in Western Oregon history uh, after the 1861-62 uh, flooding events, which were really an entire West Coast wide event. Uh, Mark Twain actually talks about it some in his book Roughing It. Um, it was definitely larger than the 1964 flood, which was the biggest 20th century event, and much larger than the 1996 floods, uh, which were essentially the more most recent significant flooding event in Western Oregon and the Willamette Valley. Now, in addition to our observed temporal clustering of landslides, there actually were um, landslides observed during this event. So there were some observed up in the Columbia River um, in the gorge. Um, Cow Creek, which is the South Fork of the Umpqua River in southwestern Oregon, uh, was temporarily dammed by a landslide and a lake started forming upstream from it, but it blocked the railroad, so they dynamited it, and now there's very, it's very hard to find actually where that slide occurred. And then um, the Sayusa River near the town of Mapleton was temporarily dammed by a debris flow, uh, but it failed by itself within about three days. All right, so now we do have three sites that predate 1700. Um, at these sites, there are two old to date with cinder chronology, so we have to rely on C14 wiggle matching, except for Buttermilk Lake, where at this time we only have one um, sample from an outer ring of that tree. Um, so Spruce Run Lake is approximately six to 650 years old or so. Buttermilk Lake is about 800 years old, and Carlton Lake is our oldest site, which currently dates to about 1400 years ago. Um, and I want to emphasize again, these are maximum ages because we don't have bark preserved at these trees. Now, intriguingly, both Buttermilk Lake and Spruce Run Lake overlap with uncertainty of pre-1700 Sidbeckham Zone earthquakes as quantified by Chris Goldfinger in 2012. Um, but importantly, we really can't clearly establish that they're actually causally linked due to uncertainty in our actual landslide ages and also uncertainty in when those earthquakes occurred. And finally, we have here a log that we found in the landslide deposit at Yellow Lake. And if you recall, Yellow Lake is one of the sites that falls within the 1889 to 1890 um, cluster. Um, this log we wiggle matched and we found that it predates the dendrochronology age by over 2000 years. And we have a couple potential interpretations for why this is the case. First, it could be that just the log had a prolonged residence time on the landscape. Um, but in a landscape where wood degrades quite quickly, a 2000 year residence time seems a little um, questionable for an entire tree. Perhaps more likely at Yellow Lake, we see that there's sort of a complex of landslides. So perhaps the damming landslide is this younger slide and um, we're recording two separate landsliding events. Or perhaps there was an older landslide at Yellow Lake before, and the 1889 to 1890 event was just a reactivation of an older slide, and that older slide age is recorded by this log. And finally, we also wanted to consider the role played by shallow crustal faults. Um, during the 20th century, there haven't been a whole lot of significant earthquakes on shallow crustal faults in Western Oregon. There's been a few about magnitude fives or so up um, in the Tualatin Basin and near there, um, near the city of Portland. Um, but nothing really significant enough to really warrant um, thoughts that landsliding would be quite common. Um, there was a significant earthquake felt in 1873, primarily down near Crescent City in Northern California, sort of just off the map to the south here. Shaking was quite significant in Crescent City and it was felt as far away as Portland, uh, but it's not known what fault this earthquake occurred on. But we do have three sites that could potentially correspond to this event because they date within about four years or so. Um, so we have Soup Lake, which is number 16, this yellow square here, Laird Lake down in the southwest, and then Calpe Lake up in the far north. So given spatial proximity, it would seem that Soup and Laird Lakes are the most likely candidates. But again, because we only have maximum ages at these sites, we really can't say for sure uh, whether or not these landslides were triggered by that earthquake. So the big takeaway at this point is that uh, deep-seated landslides in Western Oregon are primarily precipitation triggered. We don't see any temporal clustering of any landslides in 1700, but we do still see temporal clustering 
specifically around no, known flood events. Um, but really more widespread dating efforts will be necessary. We do have some samples from the Cascades where some ages are pending. Um, overall, they appear to definitely be quite a bit older, um, partially just because they're much more degraded. So we're not quite sure what um, th what kind of signals we're going to recover from there. Um, but regardless, we're hopeful that we can um, arrive at some sort of useful information. Um, so for moving forward, though, we want to see if we can use these landslide ages to build age control and even larger landslide inventories throughout the Oregon Coast Range. And here again, I'm going to highlight work from Sean Lehusen, where we took some of the landslide, some of the chronology landslide ages for the Taie Formation, as well as um, a series of C14 landslide ages from throughout the Taie um, for landslide age, and also measured the surface roughness of those deposits to then estimate landslide age for thousands of landslides in the Oregon Coast Range. Um, if we take those ages and construct um, essentially or, or compare uh, landslide occurrence to different metrics for triggering, be it PGA, peak ground acceleration due to slip on the megathrust or distance to the megathrust, we find that those co-seismic metrics don't explain landslide distributions well, but mean annual precipitation actually does quite well, uh, just reinforcing and supporting our observations that it appears in general, bedrock landsliding in the Oregon Coast Range is primarily precipitation triggered. OK, so now that we have a high temporal resolution data set of landslide dams in the Oregon Coast Range, we want to consider geomorphic um, criteria that can explain why we see landslides observed or preserved where they are. So just to start out, we want to consider some very basic questions of where are dams most stable? And for instance, are dams that are in place at larger drainage areas generally larger? So this is work that was done by Oliver Korup um, in 2004 in New Zealand. On the y-axis here of this figure, we have landslide dam volume for numerous landslide dams that he visited on the South Island of New Zealand, as well as upstream drainage area from those dams. Uh, he constructed several different indices that predict how stable landslide dams will be. And here I'm just highlighting his impoundment index. Uh, which is just the logarithm of the ratio of the landslide dam volume to upstream drainage area. And he found that in New Zealand, landslide dams that have an impoundment value greater than four tend to be stable. So anything plotting above this dashed line tend to be stable with a few exceptions. But that uh, landslide dams that plot below that tend to be sites where there's evidence that the dam breached and wasn't stable for a prolonged period. Uh, Fan and others in 2020 um, compiled a global data set and found that uh, a value of four for an impoundment index um, generally works for most landscapes in terms of predicting whether or not dams are stable. Um, often five is perhaps a better value. So here I'm showing the landslide dam volume as a function of drainage area for our dated landslide dams in Western Oregon. First of all, we don't see any systematic relationship between landslide dam volume and upstream drainage area. So at least from this smaller data set, it doesn't appear that dams need to be bigger in order to remain stable at a bigger drainage area. We do see that all of our dams plot above an impoundment index value of four, um, and most plot above a value of five, suggesting that our dams are stable, which shouldn't be a surprise. Many of them have been sitting around in the landscape for over 100 years. So it's encouraging um, that the geometries of these um, slides in, do indeed suggest that they are stable. Perhaps more intriguingly, though, we find that it appears there's sort of a threshold drainage area at which we actually see uh, landslide dams. This is approximately about eight square kilometers, um, except for our oldest site of Carlton Lake, which is about 1,400 years old. So we were curious, are dams preferentially preserved at particular drainage areas? Um, so now I'm going to shift back to the entire data set of landslide dams in Western Oregon. There's 250 of them. Now, when those dams were originally mapped, um, there are certain characteristics of those dams that in some cases make them hard to include in the analysis that we're going to do. So we're going to trim our data set and exclude sites if they happen to be incised or impound a little sediment, or if it's a little unclear if the slide actually fully crossed the valley bottom. Um, if landslide dams also are part of a larger landslide complex, so it's a little unclear which slide is actually the one impounding a lake or an upstream um, sediment filled lake. Um, we exclude those sites. And then we also exclude sites that are just upstream of a stream confluence um, because those are cases where it's 
challenging to measure relevant valley geometry, such as valley width, which I'll talk about in a minute. So for each of our landslide dams represented by the magenta circles here, we measured upstream drainage area at each of those locations. We wanted to compare the drainage areas for those landslide dams to a representative, representative drainage area compilation from the stream network to see if dams are indeed actually overrepresented at certain locations. Um, but we wanted to ensure that the drainage network wasn't oversampled relative to landslide dams. So what we did is we identified the largest stream order in the landscape at which we observe a landslide dam. And then we measured drainage area for all those catchments with that stream order that also happened to have a landslide dam within the watershed boundaries. So that's a little convoluted, but basically it's what produces this very strange looking stream network here um, represented by the black lines. So for that stream network we mapped, uh, we compiled the drainage area for those. And then before I show you the results from that, we also uh, measured valley width at um, each of those sites. And fortunately, all of those sites happen to co uh, correspond with locations in the Oregon Coast Range where LIDAR do exist, so we can get accurate measurements of valley width. And then using the stream network, um, we utilize relationships between drainage area and valley width um, in order to compile an estimated compilation of valley width for the Oregon Coast Range. And this, for this, we're using um, an observed scaling relationship um, from the Oregon Coast Range as observed by Christine May and others in 2013. So these are the results here for drainage area. First off, we find that, uh, actually first, uh, we fit a Gaussian kernel density function um, to the um, compiled uh, drainage area measurements for both the landslide dam data set represented by the black line here, the black PDF, um, and the stream network represented by the red one. So first we see that dams are generally uncommon at low drainage areas relative to the stream network. So these are steep, low order channels. And we also see that uh, dams are quite uncommon also at high drainage areas greater than about 20 square kilometers or so. Um, but it appears that dams are comparatively more common than we would expect given the distribution of drainage areas in the stream network at drainage areas of about one and a half to 13 square, 13 square kilometers. Uh, to test the significance though, we calculated something called the ratio of probability represented by the blue line here. This is basically just the stream network PDF, again, the red one, divided by the landslide dam PDF. So locations where the ratio of probability is conspicuously greater than one um, corresponds to a location where the landslide dams are overrepresented. But we want to make sure that we're actually measuring um, significant value that's greater than one. So to test that significance, we randomly sampled the stream network 150 times, which is equal to the number of dams in our data set, to generate a representative distribution from which we calculated these 90% confidence intervals. So the main takeaway here is that dams are indeed overrepresented at uh, drainage areas of one and a half to 13 square kilometers. And due to the way we constructed the representative data set to determine that significance, it's unlikely that the clustering of dams at these locations is simply due to random chance. Uh, these are the results for valley width. Again, the red PDF here corresponds to our expected distribution of valley width for the stream network. And the black line is the distribution of valley widths that we measured at our landslide dams. So first we see that landslide dams are quite common at valley widths from about 10 to 30 meters, essentially mirroring the stream network. But we see that as we move to more moderate uh, valley widths from about 25 to 80 meters, that we see a different kind of distribution and perhaps valley width or uh, landslide dams are overrepresented at those valley widths. So applying the same technique and calculating a ratio of probability, we see um, perhaps less dramatically than for drainage area, but we do still have significantly over, significant overrepresentation of landslide dams at valley widths of 25 to 80 meters, where the landslide dam data set tracks with significance through those valley widths. Okay, so considering um, geomorphic explanations for why we see dams where we do and where we don't, um, upstream of landslide dams, or upstream of um, where we see landslide dams in the cluster, so in the steep, low order channels. Um, first off, in these locations, when landslides do occur, it may simply also be possible that um, we aren't likely to classify a landslide in these locations as dams. Um, when relief is quite high, you don't have much accommodation space available to form a lake and trap sediment. 
So it may simply be a classification problem and that we aren't actually mapping these sites as dams. But regardless, in many of these low headwater catchments, um, debris flows are quite common, and it seems very unlikely that landslide dam lakes are going to be able to persist in a place that's often traversed by debris flows. Um, and indeed, the smallest drainage areas at which we actually see dams that are stable um, correspond with the downstream limit of debris flows. So Stocking Diedrich in 2003 noted that landslide dams in the Oregon Coast Range tend to deposit at around 0.1 to 0.5 square kilometers, and some go on a bit further to about one square kilometer. Um, now further downstream, where we see few dams beyond 13 square kilometers, first off, we see that the PDF for dams precipitous precipitously drops at that drainage area. And this roughly corresponds with where streams um, have confluences with third and particularly fourth order catchments. Um, so it suggests that rather than dams becoming progressively less stable downstream, that there perhaps is some sort of stability threshold at these confluences beyond which we see few dams persist in the landscape for prolonged periods. Now where we actually do see dams preserved, um, first off, upstream from the dams, we of course have lakes, but also at the upstream ends of those lakes, we have low gradient valleys. Um, and these locations, both the deltas and the lakes themselves, um, trap coarse sediment and stop debris flows. So in these two examples from Wasson and Yellow Lake, you can see these dams on the upstream side of the lakes. We actually have a fairly coarse sand beach here at Wasson Lake. Um, and similarly, at Yellow Lake, you can kind of see where the, out, or the inlet is into the lake, and we have this fairly large delta that's accumulated. So we suggest essentially that because we have um, very little sediment that's actually able to be transported past the lake, um, that the only thing available that's um, there to incise the landslide deposit is sediment starved water. Now, of course, water can have a great capacity to incise. Um, so we also have made note of a significant amount of large wood throughout the landscape. Now, intriguingly, where we see um, landslide dams overrepresented in valley width space, um, that overrepresentation over also corresponds with the length of mature conifer trees. Um, Douglas fir, when they're mature, can reach approximately 76 meters or so. But more generally, um, we've found that large wood, including entire trees, are incorporated into the body of landslide deposits within the outlet channels on top of the landslide deposits and also accumulated upstream from dams within the lakes, such as this example from Esmond Lake and here at Pearl Lake as well. So we've suggested that the accumulation of this wood in the deposit and upstream from it um, inhibits stream flashiness during large flood events, um, effectively lowering discharge during flood events and prohibiting, or, um, yeah, prohibiting incision of the landslide dam. And this isn't exactly a crazy idea, um, so in fluvial system, there's a large literature of how wood dictates channel form, flow dynamics, and sediment transport and storage. And in a review paper from Ellen Wool in 2017, she may note that the presence of large wood acts to increase the average flow depth, decrease average flow velocities, and increase flow resistance. And in the Rockies, it's been observed that large wood is often disproportionately stored in third to fourth order streams, as we can see down here. And this roughly corresponds, although we're moving between landscapes, um, with where we see dams preferentially preserved and where we see accumulation of large wood at our sites. And then finally, um, in landscapes where beavers have been reintroduced, often the hydrograph experiences uh, or exhibits decreased flashiness during flood events. So in this photo from Wasson Lake, I apologize, it's a little blurry, but we can see the lake back here, just off the screen, we have a large accumulation, essentially a log jam of large wood against the deposit. And we can see that in this case, the lake is actually being held back largely by um, wood at the outlet. So just to sum up this piece, um, we've suggested that we see few dams um, at small drainage areas due to the upstream dominance of debris flows and also just due to the way we classify landslide dams. We see few dams at high drainage areas, potentially due to threshold values and drainage areas that confluences with fourth order channels. And then where we do see dams, we've suggested the dams are likely to be preserved in these locations because the lakes and the upstream um, reaches that have a low gradient, trap core sediment and stop debris flows, essentially robbing um, discharge of tools available to incise the deposit. 
And then also um, the accumulation of wood tempers large discharges during flood events similar to beaver dams, thus ensuring that the landslide isn't um, catastrophically incised into. And of course, we want to emphasize that this is all acting in addition to other effects that promote uh, landslide dam stability. Um, so lithology, um, slide type, uh, many of our sites are very clearly very large deep seated rotational failures. Um, other sites almost appear as large deep seated mega debris flows. Um, which will likely affect stability. And then also composition. So in the Southern Taiyi Formation, um, we see very large, massive sandstone beds that tend to deposit huge blocks in the channels. Whereas for the North in the Taiyi, where uh, siltstone is more predominant, uh, we often see landslides that are more easily degradable and maybe likely to um, fail more quickly. All right, so just to sum up, um, dendrochronology is an exceptionally useful tool for dating landslides because it can allow us to establish when the landslide occurred, often with seasonal accuracy. And this kind of accuracy is absolutely necessary if we want to link landslide occurrence with a specific triggering event, be it a large earthquake or hydrologic events. And again, the big takeaway is at this point, no landslide dates to 1700 still, um, but we do see temporal clustering of at least four landslides in the winter of 1889 to 1890, likely early February of 1890. And this was a result of atmospheric rivers and a rain on snow flood event. Um, so the main takeaway from all that is the precipitation is the primary bedrock landslide trigger in the Oregon coast range. Now, intriguingly, we observe that dams are preferentially preserved at particular parts of the landscape, both in terms of drainage area and valley width. Um, and we suggest that dams are not quite common um, upstream from um, where we do see dams that cluster uh, due to the role of debris flows, but the capturing of coarse sediment um, helps preserve dams. But as we move further downstream, abrupt increases in drainage area inhibits preservation. And then finally, we've suggested that uh, the presence of large wood within landslide deposits, but also large wood accumulated upstream from dams in the lakes. Um, helps promote dam preservation by essentially inhibiting the flashiness of large flood events. But we would, of course, love to um, collect more data to confirm this hypothesis. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions.